Thanks a lot for being here. This is Educate for Life. Uh, we are going to be airing all over the social media on YouTube. It'll be on radio here in Southern California. And of course, I'm broadcasting from home now simply because uh, of the quarantine situation here in California. Basically, um, our, our governor has said that this Friday we can open up retail for the first time. So that's exciting. Um, but he said you can't go in the stores. You can drive by the stores. They can come out and give you their stuff. So, uh, you know, different, different. I hear in Arizona, um, there's essentially no, uh, no quarantining going on anymore. Uh, and I guess maybe that's because it's so hot. It kills the, kills the uh, coronavirus. So uh, I'm not sure, but I had some students that went down and visited uh, Arizona and they, they came back and said, Mr. Conover, there's no social distancing. There's no masks. There's no anything. And so uh, here in San Diego, uh, we've been isolated in our homes now for seven weeks and uh, if, if you live in Southern California. But again, uh, my ministry is Educate for Life, uh, educateforlife.org. And what it's meant to do is help uh, young people and people of all ages, really, to be able to have confidence in their faith, their confidence in the Word of God, um, and know why it's true. And so we've been interviewing all kinds of uh, scientists and other people talking about things like bacteria and viruses, simply because um, that's what's on everybody's mind right now, of course, right? And I think there's a lot of questions that come up um, because of this issue that we're dealing with. You know, what is God's role in, in this? How does this work with creation? Um, why would God create diseases in the first place? Um, so uh, these are all big questions. And, you know, is this ongoing? Is it going to get worse? Uh, even Jesus talks about pestilence, um, he, signs of the times, some of the things he talks about, um, you know, earthquakes in various places. He talks about wars. He talks about pestilence. And so you, you have these different questions that people have about these issues. So uh, last week we had on uh, Dr. Olin Brown, who is a toxicologist, a specialist in uh, vir virology and uh, so forth. And this week we're really privileged to have a research professor, uh, Dr. Alan Gillen. And before I uh, bring him on here, let me just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he is a professor over at Liberty University, and uh, he has an EDD from the University of Houston. MS from Ohio State University. He spent seven years in graduate study in zoology and medical microbiology at Ohio State University, the University of Houston, and Baylor College of Medicine. And his focus is on integrating creation themes with biology. He's written three books and two lab manuals, and he has a ton of publications as well. Um, he's written The Human Body, An Intelligent Design, Body by Design, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, and The Genesis of Germs. And when I was doing my research on this, um, I ran into the genesis of germs and I thought, you know what, it'd be great to talk to some, because there's not a lot of books um, like this about there. So uh, Dr. Gillen, I just wanted to thank you for being, uh, coming on the air with us today. Yeah, glad to be here. Yeah. So why don't we uh, just get a quick uh, background on you, Dr. Gillen, which is, um, you know, what made you decide that you wanted to study things like bacteria, vi uh, you know, viruses and germs? Um, you know, give us a little bit of your background growing up and how you ended up uh, you know, making this your focus of study? Well, the long story is I actually started an interest in biology in high school, and that grew to me majoring in biology at Washington Jefferson College. My focus at that time through the early years at Ohio State was really zoology, very interested in animals. But it turns out in this current coronavirus crisis, we know bats are involved. So, I mean, God has allowed me to study everything from animals to arthropod vectors and things that we would now call zoonotic diseases from like way back in my training. My first microbiology course was at Ohio State in 1980, and that was really my first intrigue in depth with viruses and bacteria. And then I went on to uh, do further grad training in education after my MS in zoology. And then I ended up in Houston uh, to find a job teaching high school biology. And about a year later, I got introduced to Dr. Robert Williams at the Baylor College of Medicine. At the time, he was the president of American Society for Microbiology. So he's a pretty influential man. I sort of just fell into okay, working with him. It was nothing I had earned or 
achieve. It's just God sort of dropped me into um, his uh, teaching and uh, later his lab. And then my interest grew exponentially. And that began what would become my doctoral degree uh, with courses and things like that actually paid for by the government. So I actually paid no money for my doctoral training or my training at Baylor College of Medicine. They actually paid me. And, wow, that's uh, a great then deal late, there. <laughs> and then later uh, I was introduced to a virologist, uh, Dr. Heather Mayer, and, and uh, she continued what would be the legacy of Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams was advanced in age when I was young. He would actually go on and retire and pass away within a short time by the 90s. So Dr. Mayer became my default mentor sort of once I had reached my doctorate. So I shifted from mostly studying bacteria under Dr. Williams to virology with her. And then uh, many years later, I would end up at Liberty. And here I teach microbiology and parasitology. So it kind of, it combines my career of teaching is mostly one of teaching both the microbiology background in this fall. In the spring, I do all parasitology, and that's more zoology training. So I deal with infectious and parasitic diseases literally every day in some c capacity. Yeah, so you're doing research at the same time as being a professor. You're, you're a research scientist. You're, you're actually, your lab students in labs are studying um, things like, uh, I, I believe, um, similar to coronavirus and other things. Is that right? No, I don't. Yeah, I need to state up front, I, I'm no longer studying viruses in the lab. I've studied baculoviruses and rhinoviruses. And, and so I have a background in virology. We teach about viruses in my classes. But my active research, to be honest, has been more waterborne diseases, coliforms, and something called giardia. Mm. And, uh, and that's more of what I see, we'll call it live. And then on occasion, because we have many students doing mission work, I get involved with uh, another parasite called malaria that's actually pictured on my tie. Oh. <laughs> so um, I deal with the spectrum uh, of virus, bacteria, hands-on, and working almost every day in the lab with that. And then parasites like Giardia and sometimes malaria. So that's kind of like my hands-on everyday experience. But because of the crisis, I've been reading on coronavirus uh, literally every day since January. And you're, uh, writing on, you're writing on it too as well, is that correct? I am. I hope to publish one article this summer, yes. That's great. Um, I'm very interested. You know, your background in zoology is very interesting because of the fact that there's a lot of controversy over how a virus jumps from uh, bats, right, supposedly, to humans. And uh, if, if, you know, for our listeners, if you've been paying attention to the news, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, a lot of theories out there. There's a lot of, and a lot of, I would say, misinformation mixed in with correct information. And it's very difficult to sift that if you're out an average layperson about, you know, what's happening here. In the news, Newsweek just published an article about Dr. Fauci um, claiming that he was well aware of coronavirus uh, far in advance. He had been doing a lot of study and actually working with the Wuhan um, lab over in China and that he was involved in this and knew what was going on and there were risks that were being taken. And so it was very, very interesting to figure out, you know, and then um, the thing that just came out recently was a huge video called Plandemic that um, YouTube just took down because they say it violates their, their, their uh, terms of use, which I don't know, you know how that is. I, I watched it before they took it down and it, it definitely um, is pretty, um, uh, pretty accusatory when it comes to Dr. Fauci and, and others. Um, so I don't know how much light we'll be able to shed on that, but I am interested to know um, from your background, your education, how this sort of thing happens. And we will get to that. But before we do, I wanted to ask you another question, which is, um, how does your faith inform your study of, of germs, bacteria, viruses? Um, because 
Um, I, I looked all out there for books on people's, because I'm, uh, you know, I'm in apologetics, which is right defending the Christian faith. And I've even had people ask me this um, on Facebook. I had a woman ask me, why would God um, invent HIV? Why would he do that, right? Um, how can you call that loving and him invent that? And so I was looking, I gave her an answer that I thought was, uh, you know, probably the Holy Spirit gave me a good answer. But I, I um, was looking for resources on this. And your book is one of the few resources that actually publish it, that, that has been written in depth on this issue of bacteria and viruses and, and from a perspective of, a, of creation and God um, and how that all fits into our, our worldview. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, as you've been studying this, and, and um, I don't know if you, did you grow up in a Christian family? Um, at what point did you um, really begin to integrate your belief in God, your belief in the Bible and creation with your faith? Um, you're at Liberty University, which is a very strong Christian college. Um, so can you share with our listeners a little bit about that uh, journey for yourself? Well, I did grow up in a Christian home, and uh, my parents were loving Christians. My grandparents on my mother's side, uh, strong believers. But the church my parents attended and I attended for some time, uh, they would change later, it was more liberal, I, I would describe. And uh, <clears throat> true Bible teaching was rare. Uh, now, my grandmother on my mother's side, by contrast, was uh, more of a fundamentalist Methodist church. So she had a higher view of, say, scripture than my immediate family. But at, at least growing up, then I went to college. The college at one time had been a Christian college, uh, but it had uh, drifted. I, get, I got a great biology background, but uh, regarding evolution, it was pretty clear that that was the truth uh, of uh, the world. And uh, I, I really had no reason to question that in my four years of undergrad. Said it different way. I was a theistic evolutionist. I believe there was a God. He started things, stepped back, and then evolution rolled. So I went then to Ohio State, and that's how I started my education. Uh, and uh, those ideas would continue. But what would change at Ohio State was I got involved first with a group called Campus Crusade for Christ, and that began to elevate my view of scripture to begin with. And then somewhere in the middle of that first year in my master's degree, a student said, hey, have you thought about creation? I said, what do you mean? Uh, I said, uh, we all know started it, and then evolution happened. He said, oh no, there's a different view. Well, I'd like to see this view. So he gave me a track, and I laughed. And uh, the, the track, um, you know, it for a lay person um, probably would uh, maybe make them rethink. But um, I'll be honest, I, I had not, I wanted nothing to do with this idea of creation because we all knew from the scientists that evolution happened. Now, you also have to understand this is the year 1978. And a group that was, you know, near you, ICR, that was barely in the earliest foundings. And I hadn't heard of it. I hadn't heard of any professional scientists who were what we would today call creationists or even intelligent design proponents. Uh, it, it was unheard of. So after dismissing the idea, uh, I was invited by either the same friend or another person that was at Ohio State. And by the way, these people were sharp, so it did at least make me think differently because had an average person, uh, even from my own home church, they had no science background, I would have just scoffed again. But these people at least were intelligent, they were in grad school, and so at least I had to think, they invited me to hear uh, John Whitcomb. And I didn't know who John Whitcomb was. And I said, well, sure, you know, I got some free time. 
So I listened to John Whitcomb, and uh, although he spoke nothing on biology at that time, it at least got my head scratching again. And finally, I was at the point that I would say, God, this doesn't seem right to me. This, I know you're real, and I'm learning Bible study with Campus Crusade. I get that. But this whole idea of looking at Genesis beyond just a allegorical uh, way, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. So if somehow you're in this, uh, you're going to have to show me because I don't believe these basically comical tracks that I'm reading. So it would take maybe six months for me after finally getting hold of a little bit of literature, you understand in that era, good biology literature that had any kind of creation or design view, it just didn't hardly exist. So finally, six months later, I say, okay, God, I now believe that what you said in general is true, but you're going to have to clarify for me further how this really works. So I would say the better part of two years in my master's degree, and meanwhile, like most master's students doing hard research, I mean, I'm putting 60, 65 hours a week into research and courses and all the rest. So, and then, you know, at night it's going to Bible study. I mean, I'm just going nonstop in my master's degree. So that, that's maybe explained some of why it takes a while but I'm finally getting to the point at the end of my master's degree that there is something more uh, to Genesis than just, you know, what I'm told in the pulpit and what's in science. So I begin an integration process, but as far as the whole idea of creation and uh, germs and disease, I don't really get an understanding of that until around 2003 when uh, I meet a guy named Dr. Joe Francis. He's, uh, at the time, he might have been at Cedarville. He's now at the Master's University uh, in Northern Los Angeles. He's uh, been Dean and Department Chair there. He's the first person who gives me insight at a conference as to what an integrated package looks like for um, basically the concept of the disease and immunity. Wow, that's that's amazing. That's an amazing testimony, and uh, thank God for Bill Bright, huh? And um, and uh, that p- persistence and passion on the campuses. Um, I for me, that's really encouraging because um, a lot of times, you know, people are uh, feeling intimidated by somebody who has a big science background, and they think to themselves, "Well, man, am I ever going to get through to this person? Am I ever going to be able to persuade them?" But you said these people were sharp enough that it caused you to uh, perk up and listen and ultimately to change your view in that perspective. Um, so now you've written this book called The Genesis of Germs. And so, you know, f- for our listeners, and I'm just curious, you know, uh, from an elevator speech kind of perspective, a quick um, answer to somebody's question, as quick as it can be. But if somebody, like what happened to me on Facebook, somebody says, why would God create HIV in the first place? Um, what kind of an answer would you give them as to, God's reasoning in that regard, or COVID, well, for act- example. Sure. Well, uh, I need to back up and first say, you know, all the things, whether they're viruses or path- pathogenic bacteria or parasites, in the beginning had a uh, very good purpose and good design. But with the fall, uh, things change greatly. And so Three thing, one of three things have probably changed. Uh, one is there's been modification to the original microbe. There's been uh, some kind of dis- or displacement of where it was originally intended. Or a third, you got overgrowth. So those are three overriding principles. As far as the HIV story, here's probably what's happened. Uh, there, there is something in the body called retrotransposons. That's a gene that can turn things on and off. So there is a retrotransposon that turns the immune system off in a woman's placenta when she's carrying a child. If it 
doesn't turn the immune response off, uh, the immune system could kill the child because it is recognizing it as what we call non-self. So that switch has to go off for the baby to develop without the immune system's response. The same could be said with other what we call immunoprivileged parts of the body, the cornea of the eye. Uh, I think there's one other place that is called immunoprivilege, uh, certain cells in the blood, because if our body attacks that, that's not good. So we have a good design there. Well, HIV is a retrovirus, and basically, said it packaged a different way, it is the same type of gene in the retro transposon, but with a protein coat over top of it. So the genetic idea is you turn off things at the right time, you have protection, but now you have displaced with a little coating on top of it, uh, this mechanism that turns the immune system off in HIV. So HIV works by, by well, it, it turns the immune system off, it grows, and the body doesn't have protection. You get AIDS and you die. So backing up to the conversation, did God create HIV as we see today? Well, probably not. He created a gene that would turn things off and on at the right timing, but with the subsequent fall, we have modification and now it's displaced in a place it's not supposed to be. Wow, yeah. So it's, it's, the, it's basically the corruption of a good thing, uh, something that God designed for good. So that's very interesting. Would you say as a general principle, this is the general rule for viruses that we see around the world, uh, coronavirus and other things that, that um, have happened? Yeah, most viruses probably had an originally good intent. Uh, and in their proper place, they were. So there's both modification and displacement. Those explain most. For example, in bats, viruses don't harm bats. They, their immune system is robust to handle it appropriately. It could be those same coronaviruses, and we don't yet know this. We, we just know from lots of study, now decades, since the 2002-2003 SARS uh, epidemic, uh, scientists have actively studied bats, um, and they, they now know this immune mechanism that works in bats. So it could be that those viruses in bats are controlling other microbial flora inside to keep it well uh, when it's in the bat. But when it's now displaced in a totally different animal, uh, whether that's a cat, uh, whether that's a person, it causes great harm. So the, uh, and the viruses have probably undergone mutation uh, in addition to the displacement. So that explains, I believe, a lot of viral infections, particularly the the coronavirus that we're seeing today, the SARS, the MERS, now the SARS-2. And um, it explains many other zoonotic infections. In animals, it could serve a useful purpose. Uh, in the case of Giardia in beavers and other animals, uh, and studies in mice, uh, those Giardia actually are controlling the rest of the microbial flora of the animal. And so they probably have a good purpose when they're in those animals in the wild, but you put Giardia in a person. That's been one of my studies over the last couple of years with local infections. You know, it causes great diarrheal havoc in the human body. So displacement is a common explanation for disease, what was meant for good in one place, bad in another. I tell my students this, uh, a sharp knife in the hands of a skilled surgeon is good to get rid of cancer. It's good to get rid of clogs in the heart. If someone's skilled to take out those clogs or cancers, the body works better. 
but you give the same knife, the same sharp instrument to a crook, a murderer, or a thief, you got havoc. Yeah. So that's kind of how I see a lot of diseases. Yeah. Now this is really interesting. Um, you've used uh, two terms that I'm not completely familiar with, so I just like to get a more clear definition for it. You use the term, um, and I, if I zoa zoa noetic. What did you say? Okay. Scientists use the term zoonosis or zoonotic infections. That means that an infection or colonization even of a microbe in an animal that's transferred now to a human is called a zoonotic disease. Okay, yeah, and I've heard the, in, in what I've been reading, uh, few, they use the term fusion uh, when it has something to do with crossover from an animal to a human. Is that, is that uh, what that means too? Well, sometimes what you're seeing is within a microbe, whether it's a virus or even bacteria, but usually they're talking about viruses. Uh, the virus from a person, when it mixes with a virus of another domestic animal or even person, you have recombination of the genes. This happens in many pandemic flu strains. It happens with probably coronavirus. And so the more common term, I believe, is recombination. But yes, they're recombining and fusing together to form a totally new virus okay. or other microbe. And then the other term that you used is the, is the term displacement. Um, and I think I'm understanding how you're using that. But can you explain that just uh, so we have a clear definition? It sounds like what you're saying is it, it's, it's moving from its original purpose or a, a good purpose to something that's not a good purpose. Yes. Breaking up the word dis, okay, not in the right place. It's gotcha. not in the right place of original plan, structure, design. Okay. And um, so you feel very confident in your belief in creation in the sense that, you know, because one of the big arguments that comes from people who are skeptics about God and creation and these sorts of things, um, one of the big arguments that comes out is things like, well, if God had made things, if he had actually made things, if there was an intelligent designer, then we wouldn't see so many problems with everything that's been made. So they'll, they'll reference things like vestigial organs. Why, why, why do we have all these leftover parts that we don't need? And we've proved that lots of the vestigial organs aren't vestigial at all. But um, then it comes to other things that they'll say, yeah, but why would God allow this, right? The whole problem of evil uh, is, a, is a, an insult to God in that if there was a good God that existed and he was as smart as you say he is and all these sorts of things, then we wouldn't have evil and suffering in the world. And there is good responses to those. But when it comes to the issue of bacteria and viruses, um, I know for a long time people thought bacteria were completely bad. They said, you know, uh, but there's no good reason for bacteria to exist. My, my wife thinks this about flies. And she's like, why would God make flies? <laughs> Right. So, uh, so I, which I think is hilarious, but, um, and I still don't have an answer for that question yet, but, um, regardless, um, what, when it comes to viruses, is it cutting edge science to be able to say that there, there is a good reason for viruses to exist or have we known good reasons for viruses to exist for quite a while? Well, you can read in both the evolutionary books. I can give you one that's very current, uh, Terry Shores uh, on virology. It's in the third edition. She's an evolutionary virologist. No uh, qualms about it, but she has nearly a chapter uh, on what she calls helpful or collaborative viruses. Mm. Uh, Joe Francis has just published a summary uh, on Answers in Genesis website. Uh, dealing a little bit with coronavirus. His article is just brief. The one I'm writing will be a little more in depth. But I believe he gives seven reasons why viruses are beneficial. And they, they, they have the role, maybe I'll, I'll just summarize a few. Uh, some viruses um, allow plants, like a, I think the cucumber mosaic virus, it allows... Uh, the plants to resist drought and freezing. 
So without the virus, it would die in a harsh time. You have other viruses that play a key role in recycling in nature. Uh, the cyanobacteria or blue-green algae arguably are the most abundant bacteria on Earth. Uh, they're in all the oceans and the whole ecosystem strive by them. Well, without a regulatory virus within uh, cyanobacteria, the algae blooms would not be controlled right. The whole ocean ecosystems would go asunder. You have bacteriophages that control things like E. coli, uh, population numbers in our gut, as well as the environment. So the whole earth is governed by what we today call viruses, but in the beginning, they may have been merely genes doing that correction because there's a fine line between a gene, a DNA sequence, or an RNA sequence, and a virus, which sometimes have a bare protein code on it. So they regulate nutrients across the earth. They regulate gut flora, uh, which you need for proper balance and digestion. Uh, they regulate plants and their ability to survive extreme conditions. So there actually are a lot of beneficial or helpful viruses. Uh, one other that I like, tulips, they're blooming now. The, the, the mosaic tulip mosaic virus regulates what's, what's called the breaking phenomena in tulips. To see really pretty multicolored tulips, you need a virus in the bulb of the tulip. Otherwise, they're not that beautiful. Wow, that, that was a, an amazing answer. Thank you for that. That, is, that was fantastic. Um, so I, I love that. So um, just to get now into, um, I want to share with our listeners real quick. You guys, if you're enjoying this interview with Dr. Gillen, um, he writ, wrote a book, The Genesis of Germs. And I'm just going to read off to you the chap, chapter titles um, real quick. What we have is number one, microbi microbes by design. Two is beneficial bacteria. Three, bacteria in a fallen world. Four, protista, a zoo in pond water. Five, fungi, recyclers of nutrients, nutrients and sources of treasures. Six, viruses, fallen genes coated with protein. Seven, immune system created to interact with microbes. Eight is emerging diseases, plagues of the present and future. And nine is the origin of disease, a creation perspective. 10 plagues and pestilences of the future. And um, Dr. Gillen, um, let me know if you, if you run out of time here, if you, if you have to head out. But, but um, I wanted to ask you, you know, eight, chapters 8, 9, and 10, uh, emerging diseases, plagues of the present and future. And then 9, the origin of disease. We've talked a lot about the origin of disease. But, um, you know, with COVID here, Newsweek just came out with this article where they're saying that what doctor, uh, the collaboration that Dr. Fauci had going on in the Wuhan lab was actually dangerous. They actually say that um, uh, uh, a bunch of scientists got together and recommended that he not engage in the coronavirus research that he was doing. He said, no, we need to do this. Um, uh, he said, we need to do this in order to prepare for the potential of a pandemic so that we can study this, this disease better. And there's even this video going around now that's viral of him saying a while back, uh, the next president is going to have to deal with a pandemic. So people are saying, you know, conspiracy theory, um, he was planning this, this was going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, so everybody's trying to sift you through what's true here, where are people getting out of control? But I guess my question for you is, from what you've studied about what happened in, in the Wuhan lab and everything, how did, how did COVID go from something uh, that supposedly they were studying and doing research on to preventing a pandemic to all of a sudden becoming a pandemic. Um, and uh, what can you tell us about the origin of COVID uh, and as far as this relates to emerging diseases and what we can expect, you know, uh, currently and in, in the future? Well, let me begin by first saying I, I highly respect Dr. Fauci. And, um, what most virologists are saying today. And I could mention several others. My position is uh, a little bit similar to a guy named C.J. Peters who wrote The Virus Hunter. He, he was on Fox News pretty lately, and I, I probably am going to 
read a statement here from the CDC release, released today. Um, and let me, before I state my opinion, I mean, you, if you ask me in six weeks from now, could it change? It could. So anything that I say is tentative based on what I know as of today. Um, first, Fauci, when he's talking about a future pandemic, is merely repeating what several other people were saying ahead of him. Uh, Bill Gates, Robert Webster, even George W. Bush, when he was president, says we need to prepare for a pandemic. And this is based largely on history. Um, and most people don't realize the frequency of pandemics and epidemics over the years. So I think that's where Fauci is coming from. And I don't think there's any malintent uh, with it. I think he understands coronavirus from his first SARS and MERS epidemic. So that is where I think he's coming from. And he's actually not alone in those predictions. I, even in early in my classes, when starting, when I was writing this book, I, I talk about the 1918 flu in chapter nine. It, it happened, it happened quick, they weren't prepared. And I've told my classes ever since I was teaching and wrote this book, look, you don't know when a pandemic's going to come. The, the, the other warnings in scripture also, from my opinion, uh, warn of things to come. So we, we don't know the side of eternity, what's going to come. God actually gives, and I have a list of about 12 Bible verses that I call ancient mitigation for infectious and parasitic diseases. So it's not like this is taken God by surprise. Uh, even the whole idea of eating bats is again scripture. So God has told us a long time ago, don't do this. And when people do it, things happen. And the same could be said for actually millennia since biblical times. The, the evidence that I have seen presented in papers is that the, the RNA sequences they don't match an engineered type of sequence. They, they look to be natural. And could there have been some engineering? Well, I, there's an outside possibility. So I'll, I'll be, again, first to qualify. There's a possibility. I know President Trump has said he has intelligence information, but then the Secretary of State backs up today and says, well, they're not sure. So unless he has an actual phone conversation or actual paper document that says someone was doing it, that weren't. Uh, the other evidence points to something that is more natural. The CDC actually just released a paper this morning. I'll just say the author, Dr. Lau, and he's affiliated with the University of Hong Kong, so he's a little independent of mainland China. Um, again. He says the immediate source is elusive. Every, you know, 95% of the genome is, is a bat virus. Um, you've got probably 3 to 4% that links with viruses in pangolins, an intermediate animal. So you have room for maybe 1% of the genome that is in question. And it does not appear to be engineered. But the, the epidemiological data, there, there could be a link to the lab in that they, they were studying it and it accidentally got out. That's my, that's my idea. Maybe they were studying it and someone was careless. Uh, I, I'll give you an example here in a second. And it accidentally got into the uh, market that's within a mile or two. But I don't think it's designed or intentional. Yes, the Chinese tried to save face on more than one occasion. Um, that's just my opinion. They're, they're trying to save face on the matter, but I personally don't think it's malintent. Uh, if it does come up with a lab link, my thinking on it is someone was careless in disposal. I say that because Houston, Florida, and one other place I'm familiar 
there have been careless disposals of things by people in the, we'll call it, lack of knowledge. Sometimes people are in a hurry, they have not been trained, and things get out that shouldn't. I, I saw that many times with uh, foodborne infections in Houston. There's another example of carelessness I could cite in Florida. I've heard, well, actually sort of thing, seen things in Lynchburg, where frankly, at a marketplace near, it's not open anymore. They were careless in what they would sell meat in. It was, it was expired. The manager didn't care. And uh, when people are not trained in the sciences, they just like do whatever they feel. So yeah. maybe that happened in, uh, in Wuhan, but uh, right now most of the virus suggests, again, a natural origin from bats, maybe this recombination with the pangolin virus and other animals and then jumping to humans. That's how I'm seeing the current origin, at least as of this day. Yeah. Now, I know we're just about out of time here. Uh, we have maybe two minutes here or so. Um, I have another question, but it might, it might take too much of your time. So um, if so, um, we'll just get to it another time. But um, there's a big, there's also a conspiracy theory out there right now, and uh, it's all over the place, that Bill Gates uh, is wanting to vaccinate uh, the whole world because he said, you know, things won't go back to normal until the whole world is vaccinated. And you have a lot of people that are very, very opposed to vaccines. And so there's this huge uh, kind of uh, culture war over this issue. And so every time I get an expert like yourself on here, who's a Christian, who loves God, who loves the Bible, who loves science, um, I like to ask their opinion on vaccines because um, it's nice to hear it from somebody who, who is, you know, quote, on our side um, and, and is well uh, understands the science regarding vaccines. What is your, um, if you have time, if, if we don't have time to get to it, that's okay. But do you have time to answer that question? Oh, I do. I just don't know your airtime. But Oh, uh, we're good. We're good. Yeah. I, I, I tell all my students this. I am a proponent of 99% of the vaccines. All right? So I, that's my, I'm pro-vaccine. Let me give two or three reasons why. And then I'll qualify why for 1%, maybe there could be reasonable objection. Uh, uh, first of all, the person who gives us modern vaccines is Edward Jenner. Amazing story on that man. Very committed Christian. Uh, his faith is unbelievable. If you do the biography on him, I have his original books. The man was way ahead of his time. So we begin with him. We go then to Louis Pasteur after that. A Roman Catholic may have been a believer as we describe. I mean, I actually wrote a whole article on him. And, uh, you know, the truth in his heart, only God knows, is he in heaven? Uh, only God knows. But he certainly abides by biblical principles all his life and has a faith in perspective. He's the next big figure in developing and understanding vaccines. So the first two pioneers are either Christian or like really Christian worldview that's in the same camp. So that's the first historical reasons. Second, they work. And then I've written an article, actually two of them recently, called Wise Blood 1 and 2, the whole concept that our body and white cells are kind of designed and built to have a memory and learn things with exposure. So I actually think built within the body is this idea that we, the, the, the immune system learns of uh, both beneficial microbes as well as pathogenic, and it builds the appropriate response. So those are all the reasons I believe that vaccines in general are good. The 1% the qualification is this, uh, and it has nothing to do with Bill Gates uh, generally. I like Bill Gates, so I'll just first say that. Um, 
and uh, I don't think he's a Christian or anything, but uh, I, I generally like Bill Gates, so I need to, to say that. All the conspiracy theories, I don't know about all that. But um, the, the 1% qualification on vaccines may be threefold. One is uh, some vaccines don't work, so if they don't have a good track record, maybe you should not take that particular one. The, the second objection to a few vaccines, there was like a number of years ago, the, the sort of forcing of the papilloma virus on all children uh, who may have not had any possibility of sexual promiscuity and all the rest. So that was kind of overkill or over part on some government for that particular one. And then the third qualification of some vaccine, some are grown up in aborted tissue, not all, but a few. So there could be some conscientious objections to a few, again, I'm qualifying vaccines, and for particular reasons, maybe someone has a medical history that maybe it's not the best idea for a particular one. But again, I'm an overwhelming proponent in my classes that 99% of the time, you probably ought to get the vaccine. Okay, fantastic. That's a great answer. Thank you very much for that. And then, um, you know, regarding, uh, we, we are, we're, uh, I wanted to open it up real quick, if you're okay with it, um, to the, uh, some of the people online. If any of you would like to ask a question, uh, the great thing about these Zoom calls is that you can type a question into the chat box, and uh, I'd be happy to pass that over to um, Dr. Gillen and uh, give him a chance to answer that if you would like. Um, so uh, as we wrap up here, I just want to, again, recommend his book, The Genesis of Germs. Keep an eye out for the article that's going to be coming out. That will be over on Answers in Genesis. Is that right, uh, Dr. Gillen? Say that again on what you were asking with the the uh, the article that you're publishing on COVID. Yes. Uh, yes. Where will that be published? Uh, probably the Answers in Genesis website. I have to finish writing it. It has to undergo review and uh, editing and acceptance. So uh, even though I will submit it to them and I, I have twenty some with them, I have confidence that it will. But uh, the time frame. Uh, I can't totally predict if, yeah, so that's the intent right now. Okay, fantastic. Um, so um, you can check those out. And then, um, so uh, I, I just wanna, I think we'll wrap up now and I just wanna really thank you, Dr. Gillen, for being on the program today. Uh, it's been a big blessing and uh, you've answered some of my uh, questions that I've had, so I really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure, glad to be here and I look forward to seeing the recording finished. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. Okay. Uh, thanks everybody that was here today. We will be put, be putting this up on our website. It'll be on educateforlife.org. It'll also be on YouTube. It'll be on social media. So you'll have a chance to uh, review some of those things. Oh, oh, I'm so glad I just remembered this. You, you referenced Dr. Gillen, 12 scriptures that you have a list of that pertain to specifically, I think you said, um, virus, excuse me, viruses and disease. Um, is that something that maybe you could send me and I could uh, post and share? Or uh, do you have that handy by any chance? I do have it handy, but uh, what I would like to say is I can send you the list after I talk with the people at AIG and their uh, review of it. But uh, I mean, I can just verbally, let me just count three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, 12. Uh, right now, I'm calling them, and you understand I may get a better way of saying it once somebody sure. reviews it. Right now, I call it Fast Facts on Epidemiology, Prescriptions from Jehovah Rapha, the Great Physician, Ancient Mitigation, uh, and None of These Diseases Principle. And so it begins with Exodus 1526, and then I've got quite a few passages from Leviticus to uh, share. So some of those just verbally include uh, the idea that God is ultimate healer in the Exodus 1526. Then you have principles of 
cleanliness of vessels and sanitation, quarantine and isolation, leprosy and infectious disease, the face mask, uh, sterilization, distance from a diseased person, hyssop soaps, the use of antiseptics, hand washings with running water, a healthy immune system, that's Proverbs, and then sanitation restated, Deuteronomy 23. So that's kind of verbally the list, um, and uh, that would be enough for anyone to start on their own. Yeah. But, but like anything that I write, it's actually good to get peer review first before it's posted. Sure. And uh, I've written about 68 And it's all, all of those have what we call peer review, where people look it over, critique it, and then I get a better way of stating things. Some call it word crafting. Um, and uh, that's always helpful in the secular area as well as in the other area. So that's a part of me and science. Like, get other people who are intelligent to look at it. Let's see if we can say it better. And uh, then I publish. And that's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll follow up with you and uh, and see if uh, wh- whether that's going to be when that's going to be published and everything and get a hold of that because that sounds like some valuable information there too. So, uh, and the cool thing about that is that the Bible, what we're seeing right again, this is just another demonstration that the that the God of the Bible is the God of science, and so uh, it all comes together, and we can see that uh, the scriptures are divinely inspired through a lot of this scientific evidence or scientific. Uh, facts that are in the Bible well before modern science ever was able to discover them. What do yes, you say? Yeah. I, I totally agree. To also, I guess, uh, push two other people's writings that, you know, to the audience. Uh, the people I respect maybe the most, one's, you know, directly in our camp, that's Dr. Joe Francis. Anything that he's written, I recommend that people read and, uh, you know, the Masters University, formerly Masters College. To me, that's a great place also to go if you're in California and can afford it. Uh, he's a great resource. That would be one. The other is, and even though he's not directly in our camp, uh, it's more of a side camp, and that is Mike Behe. He's mm-hmm. a, a Roman Catholic, very friendly, intelligent design proponent. Again, he sees things maybe just a little bit different than us on things like the age of the earth. But anything he's written, uh, I read too, and I've had personal correspondence. He's coming out of the Discovery Institute, which also has some good material, in my opinion. And uh, Scott Minnick, who's associated with that, he's a PhD microbiologist in Idaho. He too is, is really worth reading. And those men are even more accomplished than me as far as their scientific credentials. So I would highly recommend the audience, if you're trying to go in depth, read these people. And then if you have a chance to interact with scientists, uh, do so. That's great. Uh, There are other scientists, but those are ones I highly recommend. Okay, That's, that's fantastic. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks again, Dr. Gillen, for being here. And thanks for everybody who showed up today. Uh, Again, we'll publish this soon. So I hope you have a great day. I am going to have Dr. Sean McDowell on the radio next week. And we're going to be talking about the controversy that's come out over his book on the death of the disciples and um, all the heat he's gotten from uh, atheist skeptics and the new atheists. So uh, you can tune in next week. We'll have that there. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you're welcome, Jesus. God bless you. And uh, Dr. Gillen, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. You too. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.